put them out. And the reason you can't is because they generate so much heat and energy that a hose of water simply cannot overcome it. Dennis first suspected the work of the arsonist when Seattle's 40,000 square foot carpet exchange warehouse burned to the ground in just 19 minutes. The heat was so intense that it literally boiled concrete and vaporized steel beams. The firefighters themselves said that it was hotter than they had ever experienced before. And these guys were in state-of-the-art firefighting a protective clothing, and they're still outside. They've got hose lines, and they can't get near the fire. After this fire, Dennis Fowler and the Seattle Fire Department analyzed dozens of others across the United States and Canada. They found at least 20 fires which looked like the work of the same person. They called him the king of arsonists. Minutes. The heat was so intense that it literally boiled concrete and vaporized steel beams. The firefighters themselves said that it was hotter than they had ever experienced before. And these guys were in state-of-the-art firefighting a protective clothing, and they're still outside. They've got hose lines, and they can't get near the fire. After this fire, Dennis Fowler and the Seattle Fire Department analyzed dozens of others across the United States and Canada. They found at least 20 fires which looked like the work of the same person. They called him the king of arsonists. It was believed that the here you can see some silicates which have boiled up out of the concrete from the high temperatures that we have with the thermite. After concrete from the high temperatures that we have with the thermite. After concrete from the high temperatures that we have with the thermite. Here you can see some silicates which have boiled up out of the concrete from the high temperatures that we have with the thermite. After concrete from the high temperatures that we have with the thermite. After concrete from the high temperatures that we have with the thermite. After Hi everyone, my name is Eric Tuccio, I'm 32 years old and I'm a scientist. Uh, I got my master's degree in polymer science and my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and I'm also employed as a scientist but when I tell you that I'm a scientist I don't mean that it's just my job or what I studied in school, I mean that you know, this is who I am. Uh, I take it that seriously, and that's actually one of the reasons that I'm here is because is you know to defend my profession. And I'll you know get more get back to that later, but you know as a scientist, you know I also have a kind of responsibility to be here because 9/11 um, and what brought the buildings down is a science problem. It's a science and engineering problem. You know if all of the people that died that day had drowned, you know there would be a plumber here. There would be a whole bunch of plumbers. You know, there would be a plumber here sitting here talking to you. And, uh, you know, I'd be far, far away. Um, another reason I'm here is that I'm an American citizen, and then I take my responsibility as an American citizen seriously also. And uh, this country of ours is made up of people that, uh, of that vote. And, uh, you know, they need to be kept informed and so they can vote, you know, according, in accordance with reality. And uh, elected officials, you know, they also need to know what really happens so that, you know, they too can, you know, make decisions based on reality. And uh, the last reason that I'm here is I feel terrible, just like we all do about what happened that day. And uh, I know I didn't lose anybody personally, uh, but I know personally it was close to me, but um, people from my town died like uh, I'm a uh, science fair judge every year at uh, the high school in my town the Westfield High School and outside the gym where the science fair is there's a plaque of uh, a young man who was the best basketball player that ever came out of Westfield High School and he died on the planes one of the planes and um, at UMass in the on the bottom floor of the Letterly Graduate Research Tower there is a picture of a man who also died on the planes that worked on the computer department. 
And um, so this affects everybody because these people that died were our neighbors and um, people from all the different countries. Um, people from all different countries died that day and that's what affects them too. It's basically it affects the whole world. And um, I'm also a citizen of the world, so that's another reason I suppose I and um, I'm also uh, the kind of person that gets pretty angry when people die for no reason because of senseless, ridiculous violence. And so I'm sort of equal parts sad and angry about that day. And um, you know, out of respect for the people that died, and you know, you know for the people that you know are forced to press on, um, I've chosen to be here to speak with you today. Uh, so what do I, my message is pretty, you know, short and sweet, really. It's, um, I'm to, what I have to say is basically that, um, you know, if I told you that last week I had breakfast on the moon with Osama bin Laden, you would say probably something like, hey, that's crazy, and you'd be right. Or you might say, hey, talk sense, man, that's, that's impossible. And I'd have to correct you, and I'd say, no, no, actually, that's not impossible. You know, there's nothing stopping me from having gone to the moon. And there's nothing stopping Osama bin Laden from having gone to the moon last week, and we could have had our waffles and you know, come home. And I could be here sitting here talking to you. There's nothing impossible about that at all. And so why am I telling you that? I'm just trying to illustrate that there's a really big difference between something that's unlikely or improbable in something that's impossible. Um, like, now I can roll the dice and get cat's eyes a hundred times in a row. You know, that's unlikely, but it's not impossible. Whereas, you know, I can't ever roll the dice and get a 13. You know, so, that's impossible. So, you know, why am I telling you this? Well, you know what else is impossible? Melting steel with jet fuel. Um, you can't do it. It's impossible. Um, you have as much luck melting steel with ice. Like, imagine if I brought you a big steel beam and I said, oh, I'll give you a billion dollars if you can melt this. And you say, okay, sure. And I said, okay, but you have to do it with this bucket of ice. You would just laugh at me. You'd say, that's, that's crazy. That's impossible. Um, and that's sort of obvious because ice is very cold and your jet fuel is very hot. But, you know, let's say that, you know, I gave you a lighter, like a butane lighter, and said, well, try it with this. I'll give you a billion dollars. You might be inclined to try. Say, well, that's pretty hot. I'll do it. Maybe it'll work. Turns out it wouldn't work. It's not hot enough. It's just not hot enough. Um, now, let's say I said, all right, I'll give you all the office furniture. Anything normally found in an office building. You can burn it. Just set it on fire any way you want. And you can try and melt this steel beam. You might try that. It wouldn't work either. It's not hot enough. And then, you know, if you try it with jet fuel, it too is not hot enough to melt the steel. So, what's the point of all this? Well, the point is, is that when the 9-11 first responders, after the building came down, when they went into the pile, um, when they went into the pile to, you know, save you and your neighbors and your family, you know, because they didn't know that you weren't in there. They just go in there to save anybody that's in it. They don't care who it is. Um, and they went in there, they found a lot of molten steel. They found steel beams with metal dripping off the ends. They found elevator shafts um, with large pools of molten steel at the bottom of them. They found um, parts of the pile that they described as being like a foundry. There was so much molten steel. And the problem is that unfortunately the official scientific explanation for what brought the buildings down can't account for even one drop of molten steel. Um, um, because there's nothing normally in an office building or on an airplane that can melt the steel. That could melt even one drop of steel, not like, you know, aspects of the pile being like a foundry, I mean like one drop. If you found one drop of molten steel, there'd be no explanation for it. Um, 
So what's that mean? Well, you know, as you know, you the listener have these three options. Okay, you can reject bulletproof scientific laws that have never been violated in 200 years, you know, since they've been known about, and you and say that it was the office furniture and the jet fuel that melted that steel. Or you can say that you know, the first responders are not heroes. They're actually Al-Qaeda operatives lying about the existence of the molten steel. There actually was no molten steel, and they're Al-Qaeda operatives trying to throw you off the trail. Um, you, have, you can, or your third option, you can throw out the official scientific explanation. Uh, so when you're given those three options, and when you realize that those are your only three options, then you might be wondering, you know, how did the official scientific explanation come into being? Well, the way that that happened is that there's nothing scientific about it. Um, you know, if, if you were doing a scientific investigation, either, you know, forensically after the fact, like, you know, if a house burns down, you go and you try and figure out what to do, like what happened, try to determine what happened. Um, or, you know, um, through experimentation, you just want to know about something scientifically, so you do a bunch of experiments to try and figure out what's going on. What you have to do is, in either case, you collect all the observations and you base your conclusions on all the observations. What you can't do is look at only the observations, or you can't base your conclusion on only the observations that support your conclusion and then reject all the other observations that don't support your conclusion just for the sake of having a conclusion. You can't do that um, because that is not science that is fraud. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. Um, none of the 9-11 first responders' testimonies was included in the actual report or to guide the uh, analysis for what they were going to test for to try and determine what happened. Um, you know, if they had done that, they would have said, hey, first responders, what did you see? Oh, we saw molten steel. Oh, well, we better do a whole battery of tests to find out what could have melted this steel because Lord knows jet fuel and office furniture can't melt the steel. So we better do some tests. None of those tests were done. And to make matters worse, all the evidence was destroyed. All the steel was sent away, destroyed. There's no evidence left to test. Um, So, long story short, um, the official story is a lie, and the people involved are actually criminals by way of scientific fraud. You know, there's nobody, and nobody in this world, scientists or no, that can stand against anything I've just told you. Nobody's going to come in here tomorrow and melt steel with jet fuel any more than they're going to melt it with ice. And um, I, mean, I don't know how many smoking guns you need uh, to you know, convince yourself that the government is lying to you. Um, you know, but this is the only one I need, and I don't need to know anything else. I, mean, I don't need 20 smoking guns. I mean, I need one. This is all I need. I don't need anything. I don't need to spend, you know weeks learning and you know doing all that. like that's all you need you just need what i just told you and that's it you can't melt steel with jet fuel how'd all the molten steel get there done how hard was that if you need to convince anybody that maybe there's something to this 9-11 truth movement then just tell them that there's nothing anybody can say um you know you'll have the truth on your side you know um